And then once it's recorded, I upload it to YouTube. And then I put a link on Challenge. And so he'll be able to see it, but you'll be able to see it too. As you can see on the board, we're doing pat a shoe. Um, and we're doing the pre cooking method. The pre cooking method involves cooking the flour before it's baked. So we're actually going to cook it on, on the burner. And then we're going to uh, pipe it and bake it. And um, the benefits of doing that is that we end up with uh, we end up with a lot of water loaded up into the dough. And uh, all that water eventually so it's trapped inside the dough. So what's going to happen when it gets the hot oven? It's going to turn to steam. And that steam is going to cause the dough to go from being, let's say, a ball of dough to being a hollow product, right? Same thing goes if you do it in a log shape, it'll become a giant hollow log. This is usually what we use for, let's say, eclairs. Uh, uh, the log shape and the round one is what we refer to as a profiterole. Profiteroles are really popular for savory applications too. I used to make these, whenever we had downtime, I would make up 200 of each. And then as soon as they're baked, throw them in big garbage bags, put them up in the freezer. When the executive chef would call down, we would say, I need, you know, 250 profiteroles for an appetizer. They don't have any sugar in them. So with no sugar in them, they're neutral, you can put anything in them. So if you want like, you know, pulled pork barbecue inside of a crunchy pastry, you can do that. You want to put, let's say, you know, hen of the woods mushrooms and a cream sauce inside of a pre pastry, you can do that. Um, and he would do that. He would come up with different appetizer designs for these things. And he would ask me 250 profiteroles. He's going to offer an appetizer as a special, let's say four pieces for an appetizer. And um, I'd send them up to them. But then we would fill them in the pastry department. We'd fill them with pastry cream, dip them in chocolate, or we would dip them in caramel and build what's known as a croquembouche. And a croquembouche is a cone-shaped thing. It's um, the original wedding cake in France. What we know as wedding cakes here in the United States are basically from England. It's all British. Um, the French did a croquembouche as their wedding cake for many, many years, generations. And now the English style of wedding cake has taken over. But a croquembouche is basically profiteroles, dozens and dozens of them, dipped in caramel and built into this giant hollow cone, sometimes three, three and a half feet tall, and then decorated with sugar garnishes and decorations. And it's really, really quite special. Um, of course, I can just dip them like I do with eclairs, or you dip them in ganache. I can fill them with pastry cream. But I could also fill them with any one of a number of different fillings. Whatever, whatever is something I enjoy, I can fill it with because it is neutral. So it will, it will just be good with anything. If you go to France to a pastry shop, you'll see that they not only have the traditional eclairs like with pastry cream, but they have them filled with pastry creams that are flavored, different types of creams like Bavarian cream, Diplomat cream, um, mousses, all kinds of different things they put inside of it. So they're really good. Um, so I'm going to make some profiteroles today. I'm also going to make some eclairs. I'm also going to make some swans. Um, swans are just a way of kind of showing off your skill, showing off what you do, and to dress up your, your, your table. Um, I used to do Sunday brunch, like, every Sunday for a couple of years. And we used to, Saturday I'd make all these swans. Um, I'd get all the bodies. All the, the body and wings, these things would be piped, and the next would be piped, all baked off. And in the morning, I'd assemble them. My pastry table at the buffet, at the Sunday brunch, was about as long as the chef station. So I'd line the entire thing all the way around the sides with about 75 swans. And um, some people don't want a whole lot of sweets after a big brunch. So all they wanted was something light and something small. So I would just fill each swan with a little bit of pastry cream and the rest with whipped cream. And they would just have those and enjoy them. The kids love them too. People would bring their kids to Sunday brunch. And I, I remember I remember staying there at the pastry table once and I just saw this little girl, she's probably four or so, three, three and a half, four years old, little tiny girl, came cruising through the crowd. Next thing I know, she comes up to the table and she disappears behind the table. So <laughs> I, I look over and she's looking up at me 
and I crossed my arms like this, and she just, you know, almost trembling in fear. And then one little hand comes up, grabs a swan, takes it on down. She scurries away to her parents. Cutest thing I ever saw. And it's it, that's the reason I make swans. You know, it's for them because for some the kids don't feel comfortable with all of the more fancy pastries we make. They're not sure about whether they're going to enjoy it, but they know they're going to enjoy that swan. So um, I'll, I'll make some of those today. I normally will pipe those separately. In a, in, I'll pipe the bodies on one pan and I'll pipe the necks on a different pan so that I can bake them and the necks won't burn because the necks will cook, will bake a lot faster than the big bodies will. So this is it. This is the ingredients, the mise en place. All I have here is I have water, I have butter, eggs, and flour, and a pinch of salt. That's it. It seems so simple. And it really is. Um, we're going to bring the liquid, the butter, and the salt to a boil. Then we're going to add the flour all at once. We're going to mix that together and cook it until it gets to a certain point. Then after um, it's done cooking, we'll pull it off and we will combine, we'll start incorporating the eggs. I usually do the eggs in the mixer. It makes it a little easier. And especially if you ever do large batches of this, you'll, you'll be using a mixer. You could do it the old fashioned way and do it right in the pot by hand. But if you have a machine and you're gonna be doing a batch, anything larger than this, you're gonna be using the machine. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to think if there's anything I'm missing here, but oh, oh the other thing it's mentioned here on the, on the recipe, it says milk and water, half and half milk and water. I'm using all water. Now, why am I doing that? Well, first of all, in the grand scheme of things, um, you can use both, but water is a lot cheaper, right? So if you want to keep costs down, you can go with water. Um, the other thing too is milk has lactose in it and it's going to get more brown in the oven if you have milk in it. If you use all milk instead of a mix of water and milk, you'll get very brown. And I mean brown. Brown so it's browner than most com customers are comfortable with. Um, so I tend to go water because it gives a lighter brown. And people like a lighter color for their baked goods. If you want it even lighter, even lighter, like finished about the color of your table, you could replace the butter, which also has lactose in it, with something that doesn't have lactose in it. You could use shortening instead. And shortening will give you an even lighter color. So you have some choices when it comes to that. It depends on your customers. But if your customers are really into lighter baked goods, they really prefer a lighter color, and you know that, short, certain shortening is a lot cheaper than butter. And you can do it for lower food costs, which means then you can make a little bit more profit for each one you sell. So it, it comes out to be a win no matter how you do it. Um, if you're using it for savory applications, it's the same thing. Patashu can be very cheap to make. I mean, it's just, look, just water, fat, flour, and eggs, that's it. So let's start this up. I'm gonna crank up the fire here. I've got, in this case, I'm using the batch size that is the small formula for practical. Um, and I'm doing that because I just wanted to have, didn't want to have too much. Um, but the larger batch, the three pound batch, gives you enough so you can actually make quite a few of each. So if you'd like to have a batch size that's large enough to actually have some practice and to be able to really you know, make several uh, eclairs, several swans, things like that, the three pound batch is a good size. I'm just doing the smaller one because it's for demo and it's, uh, I'm going to pipe out a small sampling of each one and then you guys will be able to see how it, uh, how it all comes together. So this is eight ounces of liquid. I've got four ounces of butter. We're just going to melt the two together. And I've got the fire up pretty high here. I've got it up at 19. And I'm just going to melt this butter in with the water. As soon as this comes to a boil, I'm going to put in all this flour. Now, one thing you'll notice right away is the flour will start to lump up. You pour a starchy substance like flour into water, hot water, it's going to turn into a lump. Uh, but as you stir it, you're going to find that you, you knock all the lumps out as you stir it, and uh, it makes a dough. So we're going to we're going to go ahead and pre-cook this flour that way, and uh, I think you'll find that it is fairly easy to make, fairly easy to put together. 
but I'll show you some tricks to make it even easier to make it work best for you. Because as simple as it is, as you know, things that seem simple aren't so simple um, all the time. This one, if you get your pad of shoe a little too dry, it won't puff. If it's a little too wet, it'll be too heavy and it won't puff. Um, it's got to be just right. You got to kind of find that Goldilocks little window where it's just right, just the right amount of moisture and just the right amount of cooking. Now, because this has a lot of water tied up in it, of course, you're going to need a hot oven. So I've got all the ovens set 375 back there so that when this goes in, it gets immediately hot and the water that's trapped in this dough will start to create steam. That steam is what creates that nice hollow center. And the whole point of that hollow center is so that we can um, fill it with something. It'd be of no use if, it's not, if it doesn't have any opening in the middle to fill it, you know. All you'd have is neutral, kind of a neutral tasting pastry. It's almost to a boil. There are other products that involve, involve pre-cooking as well. Um, there are uh, Florentine cookies. Certain Florentine cookies require uh, pre-cooking. And there's a technique out there that people, people are using. It comes out of Japan and China. I believe it started in Japan and ended up in China. Um, and the Chinese gave it a name. They, they call it a Tang Zhong technique. The Tang Zhong technique essentially means pre-cooking some of your flour until it fully gelatinizes. So until it fully thickens and turns into a paste. Then cooling that down and putting that into your bread dough. The idea there is to trap a lot of moisture in the flour and then working that into your bread dough. Um, it allows you, as a baker, to be able to get more uh, moisture in your bread and more moisture in your dough and be able to have a high hydration dough, which will give you great results um, without having it be so sticky and, and difficult. It's a technique that uh, the Japanese still use today. All right, we're starting to come to a boil. So, put all my flour in. And as you can see, it's gonna just turn into a paste. Now I've got the fire up, turned up pretty high here. I'm gonna turn it on down to about 14 or so. And I'm gonna start working this over the fire until it cooks, usually about 30 seconds or so. But I wanna keep it moving so it doesn't stick and burn. And you can see all the steam coming off of it. The idea here is to cook some of that water out, but also to force the flour, the starch in the flour, to absorb some of that water, most of that water. Now, how are you gonna know it's done? I don't know if you guys can see in the camera there, but there's a film starting to form on the bottom of that pot. Um, as that film forms, it tells you the starch is cooking. Once the starch starts to gelatinize, it will start to stick to the stainless steel bottom. And that tells me that I'm about there. I've got about the right amount of cooking. Done. So I'm gonna take it off the fire. I'm just gonna dump it right into this mixer. Oh, where is it? There's the film you can see on the bottom. That tells you it's about ready. Um, now, how much you cook, this will have a lot to do with how your product comes out. Um, I'm gonna turn on the, the mixer. And it's gonna start to cool this down a bit. You can see the steam flowing off of this thing. If you were doing it in a pot by hand, you would have to do the same thing, stir it and stir it until it cools off just a little bit. Then I'm gonna start putting in eggs. Now, I'm gonna start with one egg. The idea here is that the egg is gonna go in and it's gonna to start to moisten this dough, but it's also going to help 
forming a motion. The egg yolk is going to help that facil help facilitate that. So initially, it starts looking like cheese curds, and then it, it separates, and then all of a sudden it'll start getting creamy again. Then you know it's time for the second egg. Now this recipe, this small recipe, calls for four eggs. Um, the big recipe calls for a pound of eggs, which is about eight or nine eggs. Uh, it's a lot, but it will swallow all that up. Still looking a little curdled. Now it's starting to get creamy. So we're going to put in a third egg. I'm not absolutely sure I'm going to need this fourth egg. I'm going to test it. I'm going to see if it's right. If it needs it, I'll put it in. Or if I need to, I'll put in part of an egg. But I want to get the moisture content in here just right. And to be sure of that, we have to conduct a little test. Now, why, why do we have to worry about it so much? Well, if you have too much liquid, again, it won't puff right. If it's too little liquid, it won't puff right. So if you want it to come up beautifully, you get beautiful powder shoe, it's got to be perfect. So it's getting all creamy again. So how am I going to test it? It's a couple ways. The old, the old chefs, the old school guys, would take their paddle and lift it up, and if it forms a beautiful V, that means that it's ready. As you can see, it forms a beautiful V. But I don't trust that method. I, uh, it's okay. Instead, what I do is I stick my finger in it, and I lift it up. So I have like a little point coming off my finger like that. And if I turn it up and it stands straight up, which it is, it's not moving, it's not quite there yet. If it bends over, if it goes and just slowly bends over, then I know it's done. But it's standing straight up. It needs just a little bit more moisture. So, how much more moisture? In this case, it's really close. I can tell because it formed a good V on my paddle. So I'm not going to use the whole egg. I'm just going to use maybe a yolk. Just maybe one yolk. That doesn't have nearly as much moisture in it as like a, like a white does. So we're just going to add that little bit of extra moisture. Let's see how that does. We'll see if it comes up to be the perfect. I call it an elf hat test. It looks like a little elf hat, a little gnome hat, you know, but it bends over. In the process of doing this, I spilled most of my egg white. Now this mix. Let's see how it looks now. Again, nice V comes right off of there. Stick the finger in, give it a try. I don't want the hat to be too long. Ah, but there it goes. It just bent right over. And that tells me it's perfect. It's right on the money. So that is what I wanted to see. Now the dough is ready to use. So I'm gonna go ahead and scrape this off and I'm gonna go ahead and put it into a piping bag. We're gonna pipe this onto the sheet pan. Now, some of you guys are more practiced with piping bags than others. Um, don't worry, you'll be able to get it. Let's start off down here at the corner. And, um, if you're loading a piping bag, if you've never done it before, cut off a part of your piping bag so that there's enough there so the piping tip gets thoroughly anchored inside the piping tip. If you cut this hole too big, um, it'll push the piping tip right out. So you want to make sure it's big enough so the tip sticks out, but not so big that um, the piping tip isn't well anchored. Turn it inside out. So I turn it inside out and I just kind of hold it like a puppet. And we're gonna go ahead and um, put this dough into our piping bag. And that's where I use the puppet to clean off my clean off my tool.
I'll get the majority of it out of here. We're also going to need to pipe swan necks. So I'm going to save a little bit for doing my swans. Now, just a little word to the wise on piping. You know, squeeze it down. If there's any air in there, squeeze it backwards. Get all the air out. I just squeeze it down until it's all down in there. I give it a good twist. And I only put my piping bag in my, the, the uh, divider between my, the webbing between my forefinger four and my thumb. And I only squeeze with one hand. Just one hand. My left hand, on the other hand, is just going to guide my tip. And we're going to go ahead and pipe out some eclairs. So I'm just going to go and pipe a little bigger than my tip. Stop squeezing and push it backwards. Some people have asked me, so, you know, what's it supposed to look like? I tell them, just chubby caterpillar. So as I get to the end, you've got to remember to stop squeezing, right? If you keep squeezing, it keeps coming out. So you got to stop squeezing and push it backwards and it'll cut it right off for you. For a round profiterole, I just hold it about a 45 degree angle and I just kind of pull it away. It does form a little Hershey's kiss sometimes, but all we have to do with that is wet our finger and just press down the kiss. And that will make sure these will puff fairly round. Let's do a couple more eclairs. I do try to get them about the same size as for swan bodies, I need to do a couple swan bodies. So I'm going to go ahead and pipe it sideways here. And you're going to see I pipe, pipe, pipe until the swan body gets fairly large. And then I just taper away. And by tapering away, it means I'm letting up the pressure little by little as I go back. And that will give you a nice taper. That's going to be a swan. That's going to be the body and the wings of the swan. So I'll show you how that works in a little bit. Pipe, pipe, pipe in one spot, and then taper away. There's two parents. There's a couple of goslings. Make a couple of little ones, you know. Gotta have a couple of little ones around. Bring another adult. So it does take a little bit of practice. Very much. So I'll pipe a couple of players sideways here so you can see that process. Again, I'm piping them pretty chubby compared to my piping tip. My piping tip is a moderate size tip and it, this is about twice the width of my tip. If I'm piping a profiterole, I'll just pipe round. Now the good thing about this, this dough is if you are piping it and you feel like I screwed it up, don't worry. You can scrape it up, put it right back in your bag and repipe it. It won't hurt it a bit. You can pipe it five, six, seven times if you have to. As for swan necks, I'm gonna grab something smaller, something in the way of a smaller tip. Now I brought out my plastic tips here. I've got a bunch of polycarbonate tips of different sizes, some are big, some are small. So we can all use these. I've got some bigger ones here for uh, use for the, the main things like bodies and for um, eclairs. Even big ones can work just fine. And even medium size, like medium small, can work just fine for piping out how to shoot. So don't worry if your, your tip isn't exactly the same size as mine because it'll work just fine. I just use a straight piping tip. I don't use a star tip for this. Now, that said, there are some chefs out there who use a star tip to pipe this. They have, they, they, the jury's still out on this, but they have a belief, if you pipe it with a star tip, that it will create ribs, sort of a rib shape to it, and those ribs will puff more evenly. It's, you know, like I say, the jury's still out on that. I'm not sure if it really works or not. I've tried both ways. 
and I can't really say one's more evenly puffed than the other. But hey, you know, it won't hurt to use putt. It won't hurt at all to use the start tip if you wanted to. Um, you would just want to use the same technique of, of piping it to make sure that you get the results you're looking for. All right, so these are all big enough to be, to be baked alone. So I'm going to set those over here. Necks, on the other hand, have to be piped on a separate pan, and they have to be baked separately because they're so small. They'll be black by the time those are even turning brown. So I'm going to use a smaller piping bag for this. I'm just going to squeeze down what I have left here. This should be enough for next. Now you can see the drawing I've made up here. You're just looking for a graceful S for next. So as I pipe, I'm going to pipe a little ball. And then I'm just going to do a graceful S. Just a graceful S, right? You don't want to go really S. Because remember, it's a swan, right? Swans don't have big crooked necks. If they did, they, you'd think that something was wrong. Um, you know, it, it would be a something. Something's wrong with that swan. I do not need a headless swan. So again, little ball, little gentle S. Okay, so these guys are great, but they don't have any beaks yet. So next step is, I'm going to go up to each one, I'm going to squeeze a little bit and pull away and create a pointed little beak. So squeeze, point, squeeze, point. No, it'll stick and it'll stay put. Now does that look realistic? Does it really look like a swan? No. But you know, we're not trying to make things super realistic. We're trying to make them, you know, it's a caricature. But the idea is that it gives you the impression of a swan. I've got enough here to make a couple more necks. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That should be enough. I may as well pipe one more eclair. I'm going to pipe, see, even with this small tip, I can pipe an eclair. It looks a little different, but it'll puff. And all those ribs you just see in there, that's all going to. That one looks kind of odd, it looks a little wrinkly, that's okay. It, it'll, all, it'll all puff out and bake out, let can see. Just a little word to the wise about piping tips. If you want to get them out of your piping bag, you can either back them up and drop them in the water, throw the bag away, or you can snip it off with a pair of scissors. But the thing is, whatever you do, don't throw away the bag with the tip. You know, these tips aren't that expensive. They only cost about a buck and a half, maybe two bucks, but in Cedar Rapids, good luck finding tips when you want them. I have to, I have to send off of Amazon, and I, have to always, I always have to buy a set too. So I'm real careful with my tips. If you are careful with them, you'll get years and years out of them because they're made of stainless steel. It's just that uh, two of the most dangerous things for piping tips are throwing them away by accident and the garbage disposal. If they end up in the garbage disposal, we need to fish them out before anybody turns on the garbage disposal.